I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Sarah Alford, uh, whose talk is going to be Multiple Affinities, Art, Botany, and Design Reform, 1835 to 1870. I've I, I have met Sarah, although I forgot because it was pre-COVID and that doesn't count. Um, so we're meeting her again and I'm delighted to do so. Sarah earned an MA in Visual and Critical Studies in 2009 and an MFA in Studio through the Department of Fiber and Material Studies at the Art Institute of Chicago in 2010. She's completed a PhD in Art History and Art Conservation at Queen's University on the subject of art botany in British 19th century design reform. She completed her PhD in 2018. Her work crosses boundaries and encompasses a whole different, a whole variety of different media from linen, cloth, steel, and hot glue amongst them. She's exhibited across Canada, Scotland, and the United States, including the Museum of Arts and Design in New York and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Her work was recently included in the exhibition Democracy of Jewelry, which just came down, I'm sorry if you missed it, at the Alberta Craft Council. Since 2019, Sarah has been the assistant professor at the Alberta University of Arts, where she teaches courses in craft history and theory. Sarah, it's wonderful to meet you again and to, um, to welcome you here. I'm gonna stop sharing my slides and invite you to share yours. All right, I think we're set. Yeah, you're um, perfect. Great, great. Thank you so much everyone for being here and to Michelle Hardy for inviting me, um, to the Nickel Galleries for having me. I am absolutely thrilled to be here and <laughs> I I'm talking, I'll be talking today about something that I love so dearly and don't get to talk about that much except every once in a while when I'm teaching a class. So anyway, thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> um, I also want to acknowledge the very, uh, the very grounding reminder that even though, of course, that we're assembled here virtually, that um, we are at least I am, we're all embodied and on the land. And in particular, I'm joining you if you aren't in this area from Treaty 7 territory in Alberta. So thank you for being with, being here in both sort of body and spirit in a way. So yes, thank you very much. And um, all right, so this subject, I am um, currently, it's my PhD research that I'm working on but I am currently in um, pretty deep negotiation with a publisher about this work. So I'm thinking about it and writing and I'm starting to rework it. So uh, this is also a great chance to revisit it in my mind again. Okay, so um, this subject is on, oh, sorry. I also wanted to mention that um, I would like to also dedicate this a small as uh, this presentation to Mary Evans, who I believe is joining us from Halifax. When I was an undergraduate student, she was the one that introduced me to this subject. And I think I must have just sat there with the biggest smile on my face throughout this entire lecture and maybe all of them. So anyway, I'm so pleased for um, that Mary can join us today. And thank you, Mary. Without you, this none of this would be possible. Um, so I look at art botany which is the practice of basing decorative form and ornament on the hidden natural laws which govern plant growth and structure. Something I didn't know that existed. And this was a really, um, art botany was really, was key to uh, des the design reform movement, which was a state sponsored effort to establish design as a profession in 19th century Britain. Now, I came to this subject in a roundabout way through a graduate seminar I completed during my MA at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And it focused on Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, I just, I took this class just because I happened to be, I was in Chicago and I thought, oh, I should learn something about Chicago while I'm here. But this course was a life changer. 
I was at the time working on my thesis, my MA thesis, which was about Ellen Gate Star. And that's this figure here. This is actually Ellen Gate Star's mugshot. Um, she was arrested for, uh, she was picketing with the waitresses when they were on strike. And, uh, she, but she, um, besides being um, a labor activist, she was also an arts and crafts bookbinder. And I was addressing in my thesis, the criticism that she faced for making expensive handmade books out of a concern for a class of people who could neither afford to buy nor have the time to make these things themselves. Therefore, I became interested in the persistent narrative that the arts and crafts movement failed because its practitioners refused to embrace machine production. So in the seminar on Frank Lloyd Wright, I had a chance to reread his famous address, The Art and Craft of the Machine, which he delivered to Starr and other members of the Chicago Arts and Crafts Society in the social settlement where she lived and worked. So the art and craft of the machine you know, appears in anthologies all the time, and it's widely remembered as an early manifesto for the modern movement and machine-made simplicity. And in it, he criticizes his fellow members of the Chicago Arts and Crafts Society for being elitist and anachronistic. Now, I had read this address many times before, but upon this rereading, it occurred to me that I had no idea what Frank Lloyd Wright was talking about. Firstly, the Chicago Arts and Crafts Society were not against machine production. And secondly, there were at least two machines in Wright's address. One of them was a machine with a capital M, which was metaphysical and almost entirely unexplained in the literature. Um, and Wright was not helpful either as he did define the machine. And he said it was, quote, the principle of organic growth working irresistibly the will of life through the medium of man. Very helpful. So upon investigation, it appeared that Sullivan was the source of the romantic era science and philosophy integral to Wright's concept of organic architecture. So, this, um, so I became intrigued and inspired uh, by Sullivan's conception of geometrical shapes as living seed germs with the potential to grow into ornament. Now you can see I'm working my way up to art botany here that these geometric forms, Louis Sullivan described them as seeds and they could regrow. Here we have the awakening of the of Pent Pentagon here um, into these organic shapes. So this was a way of kind of embracing industrialism and organicism in the 19th century. And Frank Lloyd Wright had taken this idea and had it had become his capital M machine. So Sullivan believed that ornament had to be reduced back down to its simplest elements and then be allowed to regrow in new forms. So I learned that Sullivan's famous aphorism, form follows function, which I always associated with 20th century modernism, um, is connected in fact to 19th century botanical science and idealist philosophy. And so you can see here, this is not a great image of this. It's hard to find good images of this online, but this is from his system of architectural ornament in 1922. And in it, he says that if you need a further explanation of how all of this works, this form of decoration works, you should look to botanical textbooks. And he recommends some in particular. So you can see these ideas of these leaf shapes and these symmetries, and then that's this way in which he's got this way in which they form. So form follows function for Sullivan kind of meant the way an acorn grows into an oak tree, um, not, not the way you know, an ergonomic cup feels good in your hand. It's something simple grows into the realization of itself and that's form follows function. So in Romantic Era Botany, plants and machines were not the simple dualities they appear to be today. And at this point in my studies, I'm thinking there's such a thing as Romantic Botany, that's amazing. 
So this class and this idea that um, ornament could grow out of these forms uh, inspired my MFA project at the School of the Art Institute. So I had this window for my final project and you can see Louis Sullivan's, uh, it's, his, it's his building and there's a geometric form there. And I started drawing with hot glue here, um, the, that ornamental shape. And just, I drew it on glass uh, with a template and um, I started out with uh, the very simple pattern that Louis Sullivan had on his window. But then I which would change the template every few rows. And what I would do is allow the hot glue, because you know it makes those strandy, kind of alive bits that you just would normally, I was picking them out of the hot glue at first, with all those little threads. But then what I would do after, you know, this is about 20 feet long and eight feet high. And after a few feet, I would change the template by incorporating the design of a couple of the strands that the glue had made. So by the time I got to the end of this section, it was still a patterned repeat, but hopefully growing as Sullivan had promised from this simple into this complex form. And so here it is by the end. So this is still a repeat, but um, um, you can see the city of Chicago through that. And it was all drawn with a hot glue gun. So here is my experiment. Um, does industrial material have a natural tendency? And if you allow it, if you allow those forms to grow, do they, do they grow organically? Um, do they flower? And uh, I was so delighted that after months and months of the hot glue <laughs> in my studio, it really did seem to do so. And um, in this work, I also came across uh, Barbara Kieser's essay, Ornament as Idea, Indirect Imitation of Nature in the Design Reform Movement. It was written in 1998, and it introduces 19th century natural philosophy as integral to design reform in the same way that 19th century natural philosophy was integral to Sullivan and Wright's practice uh, in, uh, in thinking about organic architecture. So I then went on to do my uh, PhD thinking, um, looking at and investigating the ways in which natural philosophy and botanical science became um, part of design, and the, the design reform movement in 19th century Britain. So anyway, that's a very long introduction to how it is I came to this subject, but, um, but I I'm unable to extricate what it is I'm making and what it is I'm thinking about at any time. It's, it's really my method. So um, yeah, so here we go. This, oh, and now we have got this very plain, this is the report from the select committee of arts and manufacturers, minutes of evidence and appendix. Yes, <laughs> studying design reform meant a lot of time um, studying these uh, parliamentary reports. But the fun part is you get to study them at the V&A Museum in the library. So anyway, parts of it's very dry and then parts of it impossibly exotic and joyful and interesting at the same time. Um, so despite its metaphysical leanings, design reform began in a very prosaic way. In 1835, as a government inquiry into why Britain, despite being a great manufacturing power, didn't have its own design aesthetic. Manufacturers seemed content to use historical patterns or designs copied from France. But after the Napoleonic Wars, this became uh, an issue of national importance and security to Britain that they have some, that they're not just copying French patterns anymore in design and that they go from not only just being an industrial powerhouse, but also having a British design aesthetic. So how does that happen? So the government inquiry led to the creation of the government schools of design, uh, the government school of design and many other following designs. And this school is now the Royal College of Art in London. And the object of the schools was to train artisans how to design original patterns. So the people that were actually doing the work in the factories were being um, um, sent to uh, the government school of design in order to learn how to also become designers. And so 
The big question was, as you can imagine, how does one go about designing original patterns? This was not easily settled, and it led to these vitriolic and paralyzing disputes over the curriculum and even over what design was. Um, it even led to a suicide and several walkouts. It's, there's, it's very, this parliamentary inquiry <laughs> and this idea over what design is was um, very dramatic. So design reform began in the 1830s and the inquiry basically was call, um, called by the philosophical radicals in the British parliament. And they were radical and that they supported modernization. So the inquiry was to ally the manufacturing population um, against the Royal Academy, which was perceived as this bastion of inherited privilege. And it was hoped that the public would come on side with the radicals. And the report that came out of the inquiry said the academies narrow the quote, narrow the proper basis of all intellectual excellence and mental freedom, unquote. So the goal was to overthrow this hierarchical system of the Royal Academy and to replace it with um, these, um, these artisans working in design schools. But you know, if you're teaching a brand new subject and you're not even sure what the subject is entirely, um, one needs principles and rules in the theory of decoration. So the early part of this story is about the ways in which design began to think of itself as a growing professional class in the face of the fine arts academies and the fact that botany at the exact same time was transitioning from um, a, a theological, uh, philosophical pursuit and into a, 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 a science as well, a civil science. And I haven't talked about this chair here, uh, but this is one, <laughs> this is one of the, um, this idea that British had this, this, this is a Gothic chair. And clearly you can tell it's Gothic because there's Gothic windows in the back of the chair. That's clearly a sign that we, so there was this idea that this might not be exactly the most robust <laughs> design theory in the world and that um, the schools could do better and that Britain um, could do better than this. And it started to align itself as a design, began to think of itself as a professional, as a profession. So this is what this design reform movement is about. So most of the literature on design reform, however, focuses on the period after the Great Exhibition of 1851, in which the Henry Cole and Richard Redgrave take over administration of the schools and they create what is now known as the Victorian Albert Museum. So this Great Exhibition, this is a mammoth turning point uh, and it was a mirror of upper-class society and it, it um, gave rise to a lot of hand-wringing over this crisis of taste um, in, in Britain that Indeed, the design reform movement, having been in, uh, in, the, wor in the works and having artisans being trained, hadn't actually, um, hadn't actually worked. Something, um, the goods that were still being made by manufacturers hadn't become this exalted British design aesthetic yet. And so um, after the Great Exhibition, this movement starts to, um, the government takes, starts to take it very seriously again. So principles, we need rules. So despite the straightforward narrative, design reform is relatively understudied. And this post 1851 period is generally characterized as a bizarre moment of government overreach in which the state attempted to influence what was considered good taste. So clearly, as you can tell by my slide here, this is wrong, this is not good taste. So the government officials say, you know, we need some rules here and this is definitely not good taste. And you can probably understand why looking at it, same with the Gothic chair and the Gothic windows in the back of the chair. This is um, wallpaper that has this illusion of being a three-dimensional three -dimensional space. So design reformers disavowed representational imagery and prompted, uh, promoted conventionalized patterns such as the one on the right. 
And so design reform was caricatured then and now as an arbitrary rejection of nature and imagination. And the whole movement is generally thought to have failed because students at the government schools of design learned to draw lines before they learned how to draw forms, which was a projection of the Beaux-Arts system of fine art training. So basically in these earlier schools, you have these artisans and the curriculum was set up so that you learned to draw diagrams and lines and a line on a straight page. As William Dice said in one of his reports, he said, a lot of these artisans who come to these schools have never actually held a pencil before. So we have to teach them how to draw a straight line. But uh, students in the schools also wanted to learn how to draw figures. And we're thinking about it as going to art school. So while you have the design reformers kind of anti-academic art, you also have the students who want to draw bodies and flowers. And so you have this um, Tussel here in the middle of it. And generally, it's thought that learning how to draw lines was a bad idea. Nobody should be made to do it. And that um, the design reform movement was absolutely misguided because it was just really boring. But it had rules. And so here we go. This is Owen Jones wallpaper from 1852. This is the right wallpaper. Clearly, the wallpaper um, with the moldings over the doorways, the wrong wallpaper. So the design reform movement took on this way in which they didn't, in other words, they didn't abandon the line or the diagram or the botanic drawing, which we'll get into a little bit here in a minute. But what they did do was also um, look to these underlying laws of nature that, you know, um, that plants are symmetrical, they use logarithmic growth and um, they grow according to patterns and that wallpaper could be thought of in the same way. If it was a natural form, it grows on a wall. It also has this idea that the wall as a space is part of the living form of this decoration and that a plant is harmonious in behaving natural law and so should wallpaper. And in this case it meant that wallpaper was flat and would have a repeating pattern and wasn't pretending to look into a myriad of a scene of Gothic cathedrals. So the most cited example of government overreach um, is this exhibition Cole and Redgrave curated calls examples of false principles in decoration. <clears throat> the show was made up of what they perceived as badly designed goods, and each was accompanied by explanations of what was wrong with each of these items and earlier efforts at design reform had failed to change manufacturing process. So now the idea was if consumers could see the difference between good and bad design, they would buy the good design and therefore manufacturers would have to, out of consumer demand, reform their ways. So they were like, we've all seen it at the Great Exhibition. We've seen a lot of really ugly things, things that just don't have taste. And we're going to start a little, we're going to have an exhibition in which people can come in and see, we'll have examples from other parts of the world that are beautifully designed. And then we'll have these British designs that, um, that really that we find in terrible taste. And consumers will be able to tell the difference. And that way, manufacturers will have to make something that's well-designed. So you can imagine how this went over. Um, here we have uh, this wallpaper. It's part of this exhibition. And I'm gonna quote the VNA. This was this exhibition it said, the reception accorded this exhibition quickly proved that Cole and his assistant, the artist Richard Redgrave, had rather misjudged matters. Every article selected for the exhibition, however unprincipled its design might be, was at least commercially very successful. The public were merely amused by the selection but remained unconverted. The manufacturers whose products were criticized were mortified and immediately complained. The exhibition was closed after only two weeks. People would go in and recognize their wallpaper. And Dickens did a fabulous satire of this as well. So Henry Cole is another figure that I'm writing about, and he has not fared well in the literature of design reform. And most illustrations of him are caricatures 
and even generous descriptions of his contributions unfailingly allude to Charles Dickens' character, Thomas Gradgrind, in Hard Times, written in 1854. Uh, and he was a, that's a utilitarian who expects people to act strictly within the bounds of scientific principles and rational self-interest. So in the second chapter of Hard Times by Dickens, Gradgrind, in an address to students in Coketown, rebukes Sissy Duke for admiring carpets with flowers on them. An unnamed government officer accompanying Gradgrind explains to the class that flowers on carpets and horses on wallpaper are unacceptable. So here he's, here's his little speech. He says, you are to be in all things regulated and governed, said the gentleman, by fact. We hope to have before long a board of fact composed of commissioners of fact who will force the people to be people of fact and nothing but fact. You must discard the word fancy altogether. You have nothing to do with it. You are not to have in any object of use or ornament what would be a contradiction in fact. You do not walk upon flowers. In fact, you cannot be allowed to walk upon flowers and carpets. You don't find that foreign birds and butterflies come and perch upon your crockery. You cannot be permitted to paint foreign birds and butterflies upon your crockery. You never meet with quadrupeds going up and down walls. You must not have quadrupeds represented upon walls. You must use, said the gentleman, for all these purposes, combinations and modifications in primary colors of mathematical figures which are susceptible of proof and de demonstration. This is the new discovery. This is fact. This is taste. So most historians have taken up Dickens' satire as an analysis of design reform, and one concludes, and one of them concludes, Dickens, standing in the tradition of Addison and Hogarth, was affirming the positive value of fancy and imagination in contrast to the world of utilitarianism where only work and business matter. So the historiography in design reform is considered, so in the histori historiography, design reform is considered to have failed for two main reasons. The first is this misguided attempt by government bureaucrats to eradicate an enduring an innocent love of flowers on carpets. The second, as I mentioned before, is that students at the government schools of design learn to draw lines before they drew forms, which is characterized as a tedious, oppressive, bureaucratic, mechanical, and inartistic approach. Now, I suggest, however, that design reforms narrow principles take on a lot more clarity if one understands them in terms of concurrent developments in natural science. Learning to draw lines over forms was a way of, to develop quote, what they called the intelligent eye, which could both see and depict the hidden underlying laws at the heart of nature. Therefore, as nature did, designers could make things that are useful, beautiful, and true. So what I was saying before about the wallpaper and the wall having an organic relationship with each other in which the wallpaper itself is like a living form that would be, um, that would represent and be part of, if the wall was extending itself organically, it would be flat and have these patterns. And so here we have, so I argue that instead of it being this way to stamp out flowers on carpets that were representational, that design reformers were looking at the way in which botanical science at the time was looking at these natural underlying scientific laws and then using those to draw out these new patterns. So here, for example, you have Kate Greenaway. Uh, she's an illust uh, uh, illustrator in, um, she's well known for her children's books illustrations in the 19th century. And this was her final project at the Government School of Design. And you can see here that what they did in the schools with this, was that they learned botanical drawing. So they worked with botanical, um, they worked with Kew Gardens, they worked with herbariums, they worked with live specimens. And what they were doing was that they were learning how to see beneath the appearance of things, what it was that force and those numbers and that natural law that made things grow which were being discovered at the time. At you know, every minute of the day, somebody is discovering how photosynthesis works or how hybridization works. And um, 
And there were also, you know, these ideas that we, um, we have these new nurseries, we have these collections of plants and we have ways in which we're understanding them. They're coming in from all over the world. And there's a way to try and classify uh, and define them and understand how they work. And designers were like, we should, we're going to take the same principle, we're gonna take that same approach, that scientific approach and apply it to design, which means not drawing something that's representational, but drawing something that reveals its hidden natural law. So here we have Kate Greenaway's botanical drawings that she's done and underneath it, you can see maybe the pencil lines there of also sections of the botanical drawings. But the uh, two geometric forms are representations of those plants as they appear in their ideal form, in the ways in which the natural law and the kind of the way in which the organic tendencies of the plants and how they grow become these, can be realized in these different um, patterns. So this is actually a drawing, two drawings of flowers, and then two um, design performed, those plants seen through the intelligent eye. So I make this claim that design reformers, what they deemed inappropriate for the surface decoration of carpets, jugs, wallpaper, furniture, et cetera, was not, as the historiography suggests, a rejection of nature, but was rather an embrace of botanical science as a source of fantasy and imagination. And so Richard Redgrave here, um, he urged students at the Government School of Design to pay attention to the underlying patterns of plant shapes and to create new forms of ornament based on these laws. So here we have the sow thistle growing you know, naturally, and then you apply the underlying principles of symmetry and unity and variety and all of these things um, that people were discovering and using those laws to redraw the plants according to these principles. And that's the sow thistle on the other end. And so one of the thing was, you remember that one of the things we were thinking about the whole reason we have design reform in the first place is like, how do we teach people to draw new patterns? How do we come up with something new that's just not based on historical precedent? We have the Athenian honeysuckle pattern here on the top from the Greeks, and we've been using it in our railings and buildings ever since. It's so perfect. But Redgrave, he said, understanding botany was a way to avoid copying. And so Redgrave said, the reasons the Greeks could come up with this enduring, ahistorical, perfect honeysuckle design was because they understood the underlying law of the plants and how they grew and applied that to design. And he said, we could do the exact same thing. We're living in the 19th century. We know so much more about these laws. Let's apply them to design. We could come up with something new. And so Christopher Dresser, this, he um, actually got his PhD in botany and he was um, Redgrave's probably his best known student. So Dresser taught botany, botany to aspiring design teachers and medical students until 1868. And so we have here this demonstration of how you um, use botanical science to come up with this final design here. Um, here's just, you know, an example to illustrate the design lectures. And this toast rack has never been um, aligned to these lectures or these principles before, but I really enjoy the, um, I, I think I, there's a little bit in common there, I think. I think it's just another example. So Dresser believed that the fundamental laws of beauty boil down to simple repeating symmetrical patterns that could be re revealed by an understanding of plant morphology. So plant morphology describes how a plant is interrelated. It's an interrelated and harmonious system. It's how, how all parts of a plant work together. So you see here, we have this flower, fruit, stem, leaf. We have this way in which this morphology of flowering plants. However, 
There is another meaning of morphology, which is older, less empirical, and more idealist. So morphology also describes the search for underlying generative forms, but you remember this is what the design reformers are after. And so this is Goethe's depiction of the archetypal plant, the plant from which all other plants springs. So this is a plant in which um, every, the, it's the ur plant, it's the plant from which every other plant comes from. And so um, there's this idea that if you can get to these underlying forms, you'll not only understand the symmetry and the natural law of these plants, but there was this way in which design reformers also became, Christopher Dresser especially, became really interested in this idea that there was one form, like one generative form from which this form sprang. So if you peel back a plant, you get to its lines. If you peel it back even further, you get to its ideal form. And so this ideal form like this um, is the generation of all these new plants and new ideas. So this was a design reform idea. Oh, we're going to go back and find the ideal forms as well. Then we'll have an unlimited number of new designs. We just need to find that generative source. So Luke Fisher explains this. He says, and I, I promise I'm wrapping up here soon. He said, Goethe speaks of the herb plants or the idea of the plant granting him the capacity to invent plants that did not actually exist, but that could exist, that were essentially possible. In using form formative natural law as the foundation for essential design principles, one could, it was hoped, make these laws visible within the built environment. So I just have this slide here because Goethe's teacher called for an end of these symbolic forms and said, you know, the new um, highest ideal beauty in um, non-academic and decorative art is plants, it's plant form. Because plant forms unite what is real, what is scientific, what is testable, and what is um, ideal. Also so real that it doesn't even exist. So design reform is after bridging these two realms, the ideal and the scientific in a vase, or a wallpaper. How is that not <laughs> fascinating? It was, it was like, yeah. So, you know, these ideas have their basis in transcendental anatomy, um, which held that all plants and animals were built on one basic plan. The thing that, that happens that's interesting in design reform as well is that they're looking at current, you know, cell development, um, current theories in botanical science and applying them through this idealist lens to objects of everyday life in order that your own house could inhabit both of those realms of the natural world and the ideal world at the exact same time. So the reason they were just so against those darn flowers on carpets was because they just were a jumble of messages. The petals weren't right. You know, everything had to be correct down to the numbers of petals and the way the symmetry worked. Because if it didn't, it was just a, a jumble of imagery that created a kind of chaos. So the discovery of the golden section, um, all the Nautilus shells, cell theory, you know, we have um, uh, this way in which we have these older pre-Darwinian scientific thoughts as well that were replaced um, by Darwin, but the art design reformers, they were kind of uninterested in Darwin. They were really interested in this ideal of science. And so the, um, this jumble, this, in, un, this illegible way in which we, we were having these flowers on these carpets and this, you know, these ridiculously thick, heavy stems that were supposed to be draping over chairs, that was sort of seen as just a, that was, as I mentioned, just like a jumble. It was, it didn't make sense. And that if you're going to have the kind of harmony of nature in your environment, in your house and in your life, then you needed it to be correct. You needed it to be, like you needed the math to add up. 
And so we have here the um, grammar of ornament. And this is where I'm going to leave off here pretty quick. Um, so understanding the underlying ideal generative form of a plant, therefore, becomes the answer to our big design reform question, how does one go about designing original patterns? It boils down to the intelligent eye, trained by botanical study, which can identify the essence of form and then allow it to regrow into new forms and new patterns. And so we're remembering Sullivan's seed germ here. So an example of this way of seeing is found in the grammar of ornament by Owen Jones, who is a design reformer. And it's a compendium of design styles from all over the world. And this is a, a page from uh, Persian. This is Persian number two. And you know, this on the outset looks like a, a very thick and beautifully made pattern book where it was like, these are, and the, I, you know, you would think, oh, I'm going to go, I want a Persian rim plate for my, uh, you know, pattern for my plate. So I'm going to pick which one of these favorite Persian designs I'm going to use as the rim pattern. But no, the idea is, is that you look at this as illustrating the underlying natural law of the Persian design. It's the same way the plant world works. So this is also a botanical textbook. And so when you look at the gram of ornament with the intelligent eye that you've been taught in design reform through the design reform schools, you'll be able to pick out which, what type, what the law is that you recognize it can see because you've been studying this in botany then you would create your own new design from it. And it would not be one of these designs, but it'd be something that had never existed before. So botany and botanical science was seen as this way to create these new patterns. Now I'm gonna zip through here, but we can see this way in which we go from simple to complex of the sycamore leaf, but you also have number one, two, three, four, going from complex to simple. And so, I did this myself with the hot glue as well, um, letting the strands of the hot glue take on their, take on these forms, and then also created these works um, based on the slides from the lectures of art, art botany. And um, I am, I only had a few slides left. They were just um, explaining a little bit, looking a little bit at the objects that I used, but basically, um, yeah, and a little bit look at material culture, but I think, I think um, we could probably wrap up here. All right. Sarah, if you have other images, okay. show them. All right. Show them. <laughs> okay, so here's my, this is a botanical drawing and Redgrave's Wellspring Vase. And what I do is I approach the subject to material culture. So I have a lot of compare and contrast. Mm -hmm. um, and here's Christopher um, Claret Jug and Crowfoot Jug. Here's all the four together. And so what I do is I actually take this concrete look at these four specific objects in order to get at this thesis. But I wanted, but I just have at the end here, just some, you know, this idea of material culture, these objects being lenses in which ways to make things and how as a maker, I kind of was interested in those objects and in that approach. And um, there's just a hot glue piece from then from 2002. Oh, I know. And then, um, so I um, also just wanted to mention that one of the last, one of the things I did was that botanical science, I took on learning botanical science from Lindley's Introduction to Ladies Botany written in 1832. And I was writing my thesis in Lethbridge at the time and I'd never seen a cactus in real life before. And I was reading all of these writings of botanists who'd never seen, who were getting all these new plants from the new world. And this botanical science as a way of making this compendium of chaotic new species that were coming into Britain from other parts of the world botanists were really trying to make order out of it. And in the same way that designers were trying to make order out of kind of the jumble of historical designs. And so I was reading these discoveries of these new plants. So I started following, I, I started, I botanized basically in the early 19th century botany um, on my own as part of um, an art project. And it was such a way of 
loving this thesis topic even more because my delight at seeing this cactus for the first time in real life was mirrored and echoed by this confusion and flux and celebration of and horror of all of these new plants in Britain and this way in which we're making sense out of order. And I have this last slide. It says, this is John Lindley. So this botanical scientific writing in 1832, and this as a cactus. And so when I saw this cactus in Lethbridge, this came to my head because I just read it. And it was, gentle reader, hast thou never seen in the display of fireworks a crowd of wheels all in motion at once and crossing and intersecting each other in every direction? And canst thou fancy those wheels arrested in their motion by some magic power, their rays retained, but their fires extinguished and their brightness gone, just as the glowworm's light fades by the glare of day and leaves nothing but a brown and lusterless shell in place of the fiery mask which he wore in darkness? So John Lindley is saying, have you ever seen a cactus before? It's a firework that's been frozen and kept its shape and now is growing. <laughs> it's just like, oh, anyway. <laughs> so yes, there we go. Okay, and now that's it. <laughs>